Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture, and we got a solo album review. The newest project from Hardy called The Mockingbird and The Crow. There are a lot of reasons why I've avoided talking about Hardy on his own until now. Part of it's a lack of interest. I never found a song by him directly that I liked all that much. As a songwriter behind the scenes, he's written a decent number of tracks I would call good, even great. But I'd also not say that Hardy is that unique touch that puts them over the top, and that shouldn't really be all that surprising. He started off as a co-writer behind the scenes for about two years late to a lot of the acts that were or would have been bro country, especially Florida Georgia line through a connection to Big Loud Records. And honestly, if Hardy was to just stay in that lane behind the scenes, he would be a presence that I'd know about as a critic who reads liner notes, but the majority of people, they wouldn't know, they wouldn't care. But Hardy has always been more ambitious than that. He was able to network shockingly well on Music Row, and was able to rope together a lot more interesting artists for his... Hicks tape series, which would feature a lot of acts who frankly should know better than to be on anything called a Hicks tape. It also earned him a fair amount of scorn from certain indie country critics who would recognize his awkward fusions of country and rock, even hip-hop, as sounding pretty rough. A caricature of sounds and lifestyles that he couldn't really back up. And I was initially among that group when I covered him on Billboard Breakdown. But then after hearing Hardy's vocal delivery on record, he became remarkable easy for me to tune out. It's not like there's no short supply of interchangeable white dudes on Music Row singing about the same list-driven cliches. Hardy just seemed to be just another one, albeit with a slightly more pronounced conservative streak in some of his framing, in both the songs that he wrote for himself and for others. But that didn't have to be a bad thing either, and as we entered the 2020s, his writing was at least trying to get a bit more interesting. He was certainly getting enough industry clout to start doing more of what he wanted, start releasing proper albums under his own name. Now granted, I didn't think he was interesting enough to pull off a concept project like this was proposed to be. An hour-long record, half country, half rock, where I was thinking about vetoing it all together when someone added it to my schedule. But hey, I'd give it a listen or two, make sure I'm not sleeping on something that could be interesting, right? Okay, this is going to be a bit of a different review, because if you only listen to the first three or four songs on this album, you might be surprised I'm reviewing this at all. I skip over some pretty formulaic mainstream bro or bro country adjacent albums all the time. But that's not quite what Hardy is selling as a whole with this, where I'd almost be inclined to call it a bait and switch, but it's not really that either. If you're paying attention, it's not like this is a surprise. It functions more like a graduate revelation, where not only do you realize those snobbish indie country critics might have had a point, but there's a much larger, uglier underside to all this that we gotta get into. Because not only does this album reveal itself to be shockingly awful in many ways, it's one of the few times I feel comfortable saying that Hardy is a poser, and this is one of the most disingenuous country rock albums I have heard in years. It's the reason it's getting a solo review. And that is not a criticism I make lightly. In fact, outside of very rare cases, it's not an accusation I ever make. The whole concept of having to live the life you paint in your art, it is a fallacy. The emotional resonance of the real scene can help deepen the experience, but the truly great storytellers, the musicians, and artists, they can create those transcendent emotions without having lived them directly. And as someone who also covers hip-hop, there can be some bloody consequences to living your rhymes, and a system that's looking to, for every single excuse to play on that cultural assumption. And while the implied real-world danger in a lot of country and rock music has been effectively dead for years, if not decades, outside of isolated niches and characters, it doesn't mean that there isn't space for a lot of artists trying to play the swaggering bad boys of the scene. There's certainly a market for it nowadays. Indeed, in Nashville right now, there's a lot of folks who are tired of the saccharine side of boyfriend country and thinking about bringing in a sound inflected with a little bit more rock muscle and attitude. Hell, that was very similar to how a lot of bro country came up in the early 2010s opposite the Taylor Swift and the Rascal Flats, especially for those a little bit more macho, brooding presence. With many of the artists in that lane, they're still active to this day, either on stage or behind the scenes. And hell, I'm the one who has said that bro country's got more quality than often given credit. Hell, a lot of stuff that I liked most came from that era 
had a little bit more muscle to it. But as someone who was active in critiquing music in that era, so much of how it worked, it depended on the execution, and more to the point should be placed in the larger context of that era, which a decade later is kinda different than the rise of bro country, where if there were larger cultural stakes, they felt offset by a rowdy, less serious vibe. And yes, that had ugly consequences. Talk to any woman in country trying to break through in the mainstream in that era, but at least there was a party. In 2023, Hardy's not following in the footsteps of Florida Georgia Line or Jake Owen. Indeed, the most stark parallel immediately I got was early Eric Church, albeit with a lot less of the rootsy Americana of Chief or more of the Outsiders. We'll get back to that. Hell, I'd argue that's the first major problem with this album. Hardy's not a bad singer so much as he's kind of unassuming. He doesn't have a lot of distinctive texture or firepower or emotive presence in his voice, where his nasal drawl rarely matches the burlier production. The sort of artist where it doesn't surprise me at all he started off more behind the scenes. Hell, on record, Eric Church has never been acclaimed as a powerful vocalist either, even though I would argue recently he's developed a powerful intensity that does translate, and way more effectively live. But hell, that doesn't even have to be a bad thing if you've got a distinctive artistic vision or a knack for some great songwriting or storytelling. And well, let's start with the country side of this project first, where I've got a critique of Hardy's writing that's been nagging me for years years now, and that's that the details of his writing paint in broad strokes that neither feel as clever as he thinks they are, nor feel all that personal. Hardy's gotten a lot of credit for being a more innovative storyteller than many of his peers. It's why he's been able to network so well. But it often feels very surface level that never really asks that much of the audience or helps him develop a unique emotive identity. Take Beer. It's basically a bro country song written from the perspective of you know, beer, but it's all it's really about is commemorating the good times. It's a gimmick to get you in the door, but not do much more. Or take I in Country. Built off the main line, there's no I in Country, but there is a Y-O-U. Not in that order, of course, but it's all built around the gentle premise of wanting to share a country life together. A neat little songwriting trick, but... It also doesn't feel that personal, doesn't add a lot of distinctive details to Hardy himself, but that's not saying we don't get clues to how Hardy sees the world. Red is a collab with Morgan Wallen, where it's all about being a redneck out in the sticks, and the first line of the hook is that, it ain't about politics, I'm talking small town, as if signifiers like the Bible and the flag and the troops, or indeed Morgan Wallen on this project at all, they aren't inherently political by their presence. Or take weight in the truck, which as I talked about on Billboard Breakdown is all about a macho revenge fantasy of finding some girl who got abused and then going to go shoot her abuser, playing that protecting alpha figure. It's almost old-fashioned in its political framing of domestic abuse. Or he gets to get some songs that feel a little poorly constructed, where Screen is very much a rant at those who are not living in the moment with folks behind that screen, or finding solace in video games instead of doing it for real, or the atrocities you've seen on the news on the screen with someone pointing a gun at a preacher. So instead, you gotta be like him. You gotta live that life behind his back porch screen. I mean, the same principles of deflection are in play. But none of that's new. It's not surprising. No, the song that initially really rubbed me the wrong way was Here Lies Country Music. The ode to the loss of real country music on the radio. And I'm looking at Hardy with the side eye, because this is a guy who is an industry figure, built his reputation on integrating rock and hip-hop elements into a country sound. It's certainly not neo-traditional for all the pedal steel he tries to drizzle over this. He's not Alan Jackson or George Strait with Murder on Music Row, which is more focused and targeted at the industry. But Hardy can't make that song seriously, because he is Music Row. He's been in entrenched in that scene for years. He's a hip maker. And this song is coming out after one of Nashville's best years. Country, even the neo-traditional side, is alive and well. Who are you to be proclaiming that it's dead or that you are in any way helping being responsible for resurrecting it? And it's not like the first half of this album is particularly well produced or executed country. I can hear the program percussion smuggled into Joey Moy's mixes or how Hardy is just as comfortable placing Blink-182 alongside Hank Williams on B or how there's some very obvious synthetic vocal layering, or how allergic this album feels towards any bass lines or fiddle. 
I mean, it's rarely distractingly bad outside of some weedy high frequencies left in the mix on Happy and Screen, but it has all the pieces that still make country traditionalists recoil from this sound. I mean, my general issue is that many of these tracks feel lacking in a strong groove or a central melody outside of the vocal lead, so the country side of this album just starts running together. I've heard these songs done better before, they're not that interesting. Because then there's the true elephant in the room. Because right after that song, we get the title track. Very much intended as the transition point from the country half of the album to something more rock. So it feels particularly disingenuous to lament the death of country when you're going to hop into an entire different genre. But this is also where the album tips into something that's much uglier, but also predictable territory. It's worth highlighting that on the hook of this song, he outright admits that he's been singing the songs that sound like other songs you've heard. But then the guitar's sour, we get some tangible bass for once, and he's then swearing that he's going to make darker songs that aren't just kissing the ring, that are going to make him the crow instead of the mockingbird. In other words, instead of Radio Country, we're getting modern radio rock. And it's immediately followed by the song Sold Out, where you hear the crowd chanting his name behind him, and he's shouting about how he still drinks and drives a big truck, how he will post pictures of his hunting on Instagram. So that's how you know he didn't sell out. And look, I'm kind of a sucker for some faster acoustic strumming, but then we get utterly underwhelming rock guitar tones you hear on any stock post-grunge song from the 2000s, increasingly limited grooves, the bass does not stick around, and Hardy's painful attempt at a metalcore growl when he doesn't sound like Uncle Cracker. Now this is where I have to reference Eric Church and the Outsiders again, because at least when he had his rock and metal pivots a decade ago, you could tell that Eric Church's influences were swampier and weirder, taking some compositional risk, borderline prog or blues, whereas for Hardy, it's post-grunge, it's radio rock leftovers, complete with the grimy vocal filters, the record scratches, and the drum machines that Kid Rock rejected. Hell, by the time we get to Truck Bed, it's this hideous and painfully dated bleeping trap percussion I'm not sure modern rock wants either. Same with the overly synthetic, abysmally mixed, kill shit till I die. It's all the same cliches, just from a different genre. The absolute worst case occurs with a radio song, featuring Jeremy McKinnon of a day to remember of all people shouting fuck and i don't think i've heard a more badly executed tonal transition between country tones and some bland gent chugging because he's now all self-aware but all the country cliches he's got to cram into the record but this no it's not a radio song you know except on the dregs of mainstream rock radio you're not fooling anyone because that's the reality of this Hardy wants to frame the back half of this album like The Outsiders, where it's gnarly and heavy, giving the middle finger to the system. And I don't buy it for a second, because he outright admits on some of these songs he is a part of this system. He plays by their rules. The attempts at subversion, they're just embracing a different arm of that same system. He's already sold out on the first half of this goddamn album. That's why I called Hardy a poser, because the skin in the game that he's presenting it's not challenging that market or his audience outside of the swearing to offend the censors with cuts like Kill Shit Till I Die. The best way to describe that song is Militia Core that plays the meathead metalcore crowd and reveals a bit of that reactionary edge that the rest of this album is way too terrified to embrace. More of it is tracks like the Redneck song or I Ain't In The Country No More that plays to a lot of generic rural sentiments that Jason Aldean's been selling since late 2000s. And you know, it's not surprising Hardy's got some of those sympathies, where Jack is the dark mirror to beer on the first half of the album, or just how much scorn and implied violence and threats towards women that would throw him out like on the bridge of truck bed and 30 aught six. But here's the noxious thing. For as much as those sentiments will lurk on this album, more often than not it feels like a flimsy commodification of that redneck lifestyle, complete with a different set of brand names, be they country or rock. 
and a pretty shallow commodification at that. I'm not saying I want Hardy to go full Jason Aldean and infuse Music Row with a lot more reactionary rhetoric. I'm saying that Hardy and Music Row want to sell you guys a brand of it that's sterile, derivative, increasingly miserable sounding, but just as part of that system, reinforcing those values. And not for nothing, for as much sloganeering as there is on this project, it just feels painfully hollow opposite Zach Bryan or Tyler Childers or Cole Chaney or Pony Bradshaw or Adeem the Artist who can tell those very human stories of the folks that Hardy wants to write for and sell to. Except there's the rub. Because a lot of those folks out in the sticks don't have the money for the big Nashville tours and festivals. He's selling this to those who have money and want to cosplay the lifestyle and values without any real convincing grit or texture. And it's not new. That's what a lot of folks have been railing against on Music Row for decades now. The commodification of a certain style of country music that reinforces what America should be. And increasingly what you should buy in order to get there. And you know what? That can be fine too. What drives me off the wall about this album is how Hardy really wants it both ways. He wants to be the guy who can collab with everyone on Music Row for endlessly forgettable co-writes because... That's what pays the bills. But then he also wants to be the snarling rock star, the rebel son who screams at the system and makes the shallowest of possible commentary on it. And you know what? The biggest problem is that he's not convincing at either. I mean, it's charitably two sides of the same brand management coin, but his brand of country is hollow, increasingly impersonal, and his brand of rock is dated, grooveless, unflattering, and frequently embarrassing. I mean, the country side of this double album is better, it's more generic, but something that Hardy's production can convincingly sell. But both sides feel empty, lacking more unique personality. The sort of cuts you get from a hired gun who writes more for others than he does himself. And when he doesn't have much to say, when he tries to get more personal and that's the big problem. And don't come up here and tell me this is experimental. I've heard enough mainstream country and rock for decades and a lot more of the real edgy stuff in the underground to recognize when somebody's doing the bare minimum here. This is corporate, hollow, and doesn't even have the decency to be truly heavy or actually have fun. You know what? Hardy references all the birds. Sometimes you need to be the rifle. Skip it. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be extremely grateful. Again, I came down pretty hard on this. I really did not want to start off this year as negative, but hey, I gotta deal with what I get. Beyond that though, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. If you guys want to get albums added to my schedule, help support the channel, argue with me on my Discord, link to my Patreon is right over there. Once again, don't feel obligated. Tough times, I understand, but the option's available. Till then. I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.